Welcome, everybody. My name is Gordon Tomaselli. I'm the new dean of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And so I'm as new as you guys are. And uh, you're going to help me, and I'm going to help you get through all this. So welcome. It's really uh, remarkably easy for me to recall a time about 37 years ago when I was in your seat. I remember the excitement, kind of anxious anticipation, and I remember very vividly my time at Einstein. It was one of the best times in my life professionally. It really launched my career. It actually made me the physician scientist that I am. It was a truly, truly remarkable time for me. You guys are the crown jewel, and we get to drink from the fountain of youth every August when we see your bright, shining faces come through the door. And we are, are really proud to have to welcome you here. It's really quite amazing. This is really the reason that we exist, um, uh, the medical school class, our graduate students. It is our raison d'etre. And in fact, it's, it's one of our missions is to train the next leaders in biomedical science. And we view leadership very broadly. Um, we expect that many of you will be division and department chairs, leaders of schools, but we also expect value and are proud of those of you who will be out in clinical practice and be educators both inside and outside of academia. You'll also be people who will be leaders in industry, people who will lead in health <coughs> policy. And we are very proud of, of everybody that, uh, that we have the opportunity and the privilege to train. Our overarching kind of uh, approach to things is we believe in collegiality and it's reflected in a number of ways and it's reflected in our desire to provide the best medical care in a socially just fashion, that means care for everybody. Um, and in fact, we, uh, we value people who are going to adhere to that tenant, be able to grow, thrive, and survive in that environment. So um, we have a very uh, special place here at Einstein. And in fact, it really is driven by that ethos, as well as deep strengths in research and in training. And those deep strengths in research and training really help us to define and perfect our, our clinical care mission, as well as your training. So um, I'm really excited uh, to be here. We are embarking upon a great time in your lives. Uh, it's really kind of an awe-inspiring time to be in medicine. And um, we are here to help you achieve your clinical and professional goals, but equally importantly, we also understand that in, in addition to knowledge, we want to help you develop the process by which you think, by which you solve problems. And in fact, I think that's very consistent with our namesake's impression of the world. And his impression of the world was that imagination is more important than knowledge. But I think the combination of both are incredibly powerful. So. Um, I don't want to um, make this a very long talk, but I would like to present you with two medical vignettes, two medical vignettes that really profoundly influenced me during my career, and in fact, um, taught me something about, about medicine. And, and the lessons from these vignettes are the importance of being very adaptable, the importance of process thinking, and the importance in medicine of lifelong learning. It's estimated that medical knowledge will double every nine months. There is no way that you can learn and retain everything, and no way we would expect you to do that. But in fact, we do expect you uh, to live a life, a professional life, that is a learning professional life. So um, again, indulge me a little bit. Um, when I was a senior in 1982, I decided I wanted to do internal medicine in California, I think largely because I already had the wardrobe to go <laughs> to go to. So, um, but in my third year of medical school, something really profound happened. And what happened was, what was described was a case of a very rare pneumonia, pneumocystis carinii, and it was described in five previously healthy gay men in Los Angeles. Um, and we knew kind of something was up. Um, then the preferred medical journal of my class, the New York Times, reported one month later um, a very unusual uh, tumor. Uh, this was Kaposi's sarcoma. And again, it was described in a number of gay men in New York and in San Francisco. So the observation here was, was really pretty profound. And by 1981, 
270 of these cases of severe immune deficiency had been reported, and people believed that it was uniformly fatal at the time. So again, I loaded up the van and headed to San Francisco. And when I got there, in fact, before I got there, I did a rotation in hematology oncology in my fourth year. And I had the very good fortune of working with this guy. He was then an assistant professor. His name was Paul Volberding. He was a hematologist oncologist, but his career pivoted. When he started to take care of patients who had HIV AIDS, he really devoted his entire career to that, to that work. Um, the following year, I was an intern. And that internship year was characterized by the opening of Ward 5A at the San Francisco General Hospital. It was the first dedicated AIDS ward in the United States. And it was completely full to capacity by the end of the first week. Uh, I also had the great pleasure of working with the late Dr. Connie Wafsey, an infectious disease attending at uh, San Francisco General Hospital, who was really uh, a leader in the, in the development of treatment for patients with HIV AIDS. In addition to what was going on in San Francisco, there was fantastic work going on here in the Bronx by a number of very distinguished faculty members here at Einstein, including the late Dr. Rui Suero, Robert Klein, Ellie Schoenbaum, and I apologize, Peter Selwyn, and Ari Rubinstein. So what was required here in the face of an overwhelming, potentially overwhelming epidemic was really the, the, the development of robust clinical care programs as well as research to try and understand this malady. So the pace at which we started to understand and treat HIV was really dizzying. In 1982, the CDC first referred to this immune deficiency as AIDS. In 1983, the following year, Robert Gallo had suggested that a RNA retrovirus might be the cause of HIV. In, in the, at the Pasteur Institute in the same year, um, uh, Barry Sanusi and Luc Montagnier described a virus that they called lymphadenosis, adeno, adenopathy-associated virus. And Gallo discovered another virus, uh, human T cell lymphotrophic virus 3, which probably was the same virus and probably, and it turned out to be the etiologic agent of HIV AIDS. The first commercial test for an antibody for AIDS came out the following year and the blood supply was tested and that led to some reduction in, uh, in the, pr the prevalence of HIV. The causative agent, again, by the CDC was referred to HIV in 1986. The confluence of, of events that were happening and the demand for something to be done about HIV AIDS led to really a very rapid development of therapeutics, including the FDA approving the first antiretroviral agent called ACT in 1987 and new investigational drugs were really put on an accelerated timeline. By 1989, less than a decade after the first description of this, over 100,000 people in the United States were affected by HIV-AIDS. By 1992, again, about a decade later, it was the number one cause of death of American men aged 25 to 44. The following, in the following two years, it was the number one cause of death of all Americans, aged 25 to 44. The number four cause of death worldwide, the number one cause of death in Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you can imagine this, it drove the life expectancy from 62 to 47 years, 15 years. This was a really, truly remarkable epidemic that, that really led to the confluence of what was going on in biomedicine at that time and clinical care as well as epidemiology. So there, were, there was a remarkable kind of um, uh, growth in the development of techniques to, to study and understand the structure of proteins at the molecular level with crystallography. This was wedded with uh, advances in virology, in pharmacology, and physical chem and medicinal chemistry, and, and in fact, um, a whole process of rational drug design was began and pharmaceutical companies and academics and academic centers began to develop the structure of, of small molecules um, uh, bound to a number of different HIV proteins, in this case, the protease uh, for HIV. And literally, in less than a decade, over 100 HIV structures had been developed. And in fact, the FDA um, started to approve drugs uh, to treat HIV at a breakneck pace. And we started the era of heart or highly active antiretroviral therapy. The government started to fund a number of, uh, a number of institutes to, um, somebody really wants me. 
a number of a number of institutes to uh, to actually better understand uh, HIV AIDS. And these were CFARs, or Centers for AIDS Research, and we have a truly remarkable one here at Einstein, led by Harris Goldstein. So, there was a palpable effect of this mobilization of effort on the part of science and society, and by 1997, the CDC reported the first substantial decline in the incidence of AIDS. However, by 2000, again, less than two decades after the first description, over 565,000 Americans had died of HIV AIDS. There were over, however, 100 antiretroviral drugs that had been approved by the FDA worldwide. These were being used. Over 6.5 million people were being treated with antiretroviral therapy. And, and in 2012, the CDC recommended treatment of all patients with HIV, regardless of whether or not they had low CD4 counts, an indicator of infection, symptoms, or a high viral titer. So again, this is an epic piece of medicine that I had front, a front seat to. So let me bore you with one other, which I think is, again, a truly remarkable saga in medicine that's occurred over the course of my professional career. You guys will all see coronary artery disease. It is the most prevalent disease in our population. 16 and a half million people aged 20 or greater have coronary heart disease in some form. Three quarters of a million people every year will have a first coronary artery disease event, heart attack, sudden death, or the development of chest pain that's due to compromised blood flow to the heart. Over 366,000 Americans will die each year because of coronary heart disease. Now, myocardial infarction, or a heart attack, is the result of an occlusion, a thrombotic occlusion of a coronary artery. If that's not fixed quickly these days, what happens is heart muscle dies, and the result may be, in fact, reduction in heart muscle function. So, what did we do when I was a medical student? Well, when I was a medical student in around 1980, the patient plan, the therapeutic plan, really relied a lot on rest, quiet, anxiolytics, and occasionally we'd give patients some lidocaine to prevent them from having an arrhythmia, um, and we did a lot of studies about trying to figure out what, what were the best medicines to use. The pace now is completely frenetic. In fact, the goal is to get patients, once you recognize they're having a heart attack, into the cath lab and open up that coronary artery, either with medicines or mechanically with a balloon. Um, so this has really evolved into a total system of care of which you will be part. But that system of care actually starts in the community, being recognized first by patients and then by emergency care folks who are uh, usually on ambulances and by virtue of symptoms, by virtue of electrocardiography, trying to dose, diagnose myocardial infarction as quickly as possible and getting patients to the right venue to be taken care of so we can open up their coronary. I'm hopeful that this is gonna work. Can you play this for me? Um, I don't know if I can get this to, there we go, this is good. So this is a coronary angiogram, right coronary angiogram. That thing is blocked, that's causing a heart attack. Within minutes, what happens is there's a, a wire in a balloon that crosses that blockage. There's a balloon that's blown up. It opens up the coronary artery. And then we put in a piece of chicken wire. And that piece of chicken wire actually stents to open the coronary artery. And if you do this quickly enough, people will not suffer any damage to their heart. Interestingly, one of the first generations of, uh, of these stents or these wires um, that had a drug coating, and the drug coating was there to prevent proliferation of cells around the stent, was coated with a drug called Taxol. Taxol <laughs> was a drug that was developed here for therapeutic purposes by Susan Horwitz. So again, a truly amazing change in, in the way we treat heart attack, but I will tell you as a cardiologist that we love to fix broken hearts, but the best thing to do is to prevent them from being broken in the first place, and we've really taken a lot of effort to try and better understand coronary disease prevention. And coronary disease prevention, that's actually prevention that's pretty broad-based. Coronary disease prevention will, will benefit your, and reduce the incidence of stroke, of cancer, of chronic lung disease, basically of all non-communicable disease. So <clears throat> um, why did I talk about these two vignettes? Well, I talked about them because my generation of physicians and physician scientists had a front row seat and were active participants in true, in two true, truly amazing epics in medicine. And you, and I don't know what these are going to be, but you are going to have front row seats. 
to the next series of changes in medicine that are going to be epic, and you're going to be participants, and you're going to really marvel. This is an awe-inspiring career. We are here to help you make the most out of that training and make the most out of your impact in medicine. So uh, that's all I have to say this morning. I want to welcome you all. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for making me feel young again, or maybe old again, because you guys look so young. My best wishes to you, and have a great year of the next four. So thanks.